What happens when you get too close to the truth about UFOs? Some say you get visited by the silencers. My son was shot in the head at point blank range. They often arrive as men in black. They know where you live, and they know where you're going to be at any given time. He said, Mr. Rhodes. And of course, I don't know him, but obviously he knew me. Who's behind the supposed covert program? Some say it's a secret government agency. There are at least 20 levels of security clearances above the president. He has no need to know about these programs. During our investigation, we actually captured what might be a real-life silencer. Guy all in black right there. Holy shit, there's a guy all in black right there. This is case number 64206, The Silencers. The one thing we have not investigated thus far is the story of the men in black. That's kind of the most menacing and threatening part of this field. Who are the people who silence the people who talk about UFOs? Men in black are real. Reports of men in black go all the way back to the 1940s when folks first started reporting sightings of flying saucers. And that's no coincidence. Well, I always thought it was just a myth. I mean, what do you have about Men in Black? I mean, if they are real, then they're more mysterious than UFOs. There's tons of video footage of UFOs. You hear about them on the news, and the same thing just doesn't happen with the Men in Black. All you have about the Men in Black, at least that the general public knows about, is purely fiction. The challenge that I'm going to have with this investigation is separating science fiction from science fact. If Men in Black are real, then why aren't they mentioned in the vast majority of UFO sightings? We have eyewitness testimony from people who have been visited by the Men in Black. We're actually going to be talking with people who were, who were threatened. So we know that Men in Black are uh, a reality. We just don't know exactly what or who they are. On the surface, the mere mention of Men in Black sounds so unreal and so unbelievable. But there are just too many witnesses and too many cases of Men in Black encounters to ignore. Men in Black appear to be agents of some kind who mysteriously show up after certain UFO sightings and attempt to silence the witnesses. They reportedly use fear, intimidation, and outright threats to keep people quiet. We have reports of men in black being army or government officials, hybrids, part alien, part human. We even have reports of men in black being outright alien. In the beginning, they showed up just to retrieve evidence, but it progressed to outright silence. It was a little before Christmas in 1987, and I shot four objects flying across the shopping center. Next thing I know, I'm getting visits from people. Danny Gordon is a radio broadcaster from Withville, Virginia. After talking publicly on his radio show about the strange UFOs he witnessed back in 1987, the men in black stepped into his life and changed it forever. We pulled into a parking lot of a department store in Withville, and we noticed some kids in the school bus were pointing up. And there were four objects flying over the shopping center. So I got my 35 millimeter out and shot the four objects. And actually had some people that know a little bit more about physics than myself that measured the, the globes. And they said they had to be four definitive objects because you could see the curvature too well to be one object with the four lights on it. Danny's photo shows possibly four separate objects together in the night sky. He saw it, as did a handful of other people who happened to be in the parking lot that night. I was the only one standing on the top step and yelling about it, sending news reports to Associated Press, United Press, so it was going out from me, and I really never gave it much thought that it would come back to me as well. Of all the other UFO witnesses who saw the object that night, Gordon was the only one who was a broadcaster. Millions of people were hearing about Gordon's UFO sighting. 
And not long after, strange things started happening in the life of Danny Gordon. And I was invited to Virginia Beach to speak to United Press International. I took the photos to show them, but I left the negatives at home. I was supposed to meet with the folks at uh, Oceana Naval Base and CIA headquarters, and when I called them, they said, the, the general's not here, was going to meet with you. By the way, did you bring the negatives? And being an old dumb country boy, I said, no, I left them at home. When I got home from Virginia Beach, I found that my negatives, only those negatives had been taken. If the negatives just disappeared, that'd be one thing. But for Danny to tell the CIA that he left the negatives at home, and then to find the negatives missing, that just seems more than a coincidence. It doesn't sound like you were actually threatened at all. Did, did that ever happen in oh, any yes. way, shape, or form? What I, used happened? Get, I used to get telephone calls saying, you know, this is time you leave alone, it's a defense matter. There were government issued black cars following me to home. A gentleman called me yeah. saying, if you talk to these reporters, you're going to put yourself or your family in, in very jeopardy. And, and I did. In 1991, the ongoing intimidation of Danny Gordon became more than just threats. It became actual physical violence. My son was uh, at a party and we shot the head at point blank range right here in the temple. 32 Magnum. He passed out on the table at 9.30 and woke up 21 days later in the rehab center blind in Rona. We still don't know who shot him because the other guys at the party first said it was some guys dressed in black. Then they changed the story and said it was him. And from 1991 to now, we don't know who shot him. Do you suspect that the men in black came to these witnesses and persuaded them not to continue with their testimony? I would hope not. I would hope not. So I said, if there's just an iota of a chance that it might have been connected to the UFOs, I told my wife, I cannot continue to do this and take a chance. Whether or not the men in black shot Danny Gordon's son remains to be seen. The incident frightened him so much, though, that he stopped talking about UFOs, period. Now, talking to us 18 years later, he's finally breaking his silence. Do you believe that the men in black are real? They actually exist? And what do you think their purpose is? There's no doubt, because I've talked to too many witnesses who've had UFO visitations, sightings, and then had the men in black come and try to, to look at their pictures, take their pictures. Some people actually had, had them seized. Now, whether or not they dress in black, I don't know, but I know that someone came to my home, broke in my home, and who knows, may have been involved with the shooting of my son. If the men in black did indeed shoot Danny Gordon's son, they left no incriminating evidence. To get closer to the answer, we need to find a case where some tangible evidence was left behind. I am Timothy Beckley. I took one of the only photographs of an authentic man in black. Timothy Beckley is a UFO author who had his own mysterious encounter with a man in black. Only Beckley was lucky enough to have a camera with him. In 1968, a rash of UFO sightings envelops the skies over northern New Jersey, and in particular, Jersey City. Uh, there were a number of cases where UFOs had come down uh, fairly low and landed in a nearby park. And uh, several teenagers had uh, been very upset and they ran and told their parents. One of the individuals that I was in touch with was a fellow by the name of Jack Robinson, who he was the investigator on the case. And he actually claims while they were uh, interviewing these teenage witnesses that they could see the black uh, Cadillac uh, parked uh, down the street with the tinted windows. And every once in a while, the window would roll down and somebody would uh, would uh, peer out. While he would go to work, he worked in a bank in, uh, in New York. He would take the path train over every day and his wife would go out and do the uh, normal errand shopping and everything like that you know and uh, she reported while she would leave the building there would be a mysterious person standing in the doorway across the street dressed in black black uh, hat over its uh, face so we decided well we're going to take a drive over to jersey city one morning kind of to see if anything was really going on well sure enough we get there and here is this individual standing stone face in the in the doorway with the hat pulled down over its eyes dressed in the black uh, kind of looking like it didn't, blo didn't belong in the neighborhood. So uh, Jim hands me his camera. I go and I lean out the window and I take a photograph of this individual standing in the doorway. Now, 
what makes you think that this is a man in black as opposed to just a man in a black suit that well, happens why, to hang out well, in the yeah, street every day. You know, it, it's a residential area where they would know everybody who lives in the neighborhood. I mean, all, especially in this time period, everybody knew their neighbors. You know who lives next door. You know who lives upstairs. Uh, and this person doesn't fit. We figure we would take the car, drive it around the corner, and get out and confront this individual and find out what was his reason for standing in that corner of that building. We circled the block. We stopped the car, he was gone, and the black automobile he might have uh, arrived in was also gone. He just disappeared almost into thin air. Somehow, Beckley was able to catch the alleged man in black off guard. This is his story. For the first time ever, an actual man in black is caught in a photograph. Yes, Tim Beckley snapped a picture of a man in black. But what if that's just it? A photograph of a man who just happened to be wearing black. You're confident that men in black are real. This is real. This well, is not mythology. This is not something that somebody made up. No, no, it is not. This is really happening. And this photograph proves it. After looking at Tim Beckley's photo, there are no signs of digital or photographic manipulation and the artifacts present in the photo are more than likely a byproduct of the film's emulsion. Tim shot this photo in Jersey City in 1965. The truck shown in the foreground is a first generation Chevrolet C10 pickup. And this is probably a 1962 C10. You can tell by the rounded single headlight, the inverted windshield wiper on the passenger side, and the large rectangular side view mirrors. If this were a real man in black, he more than likely would have been aware of Tim's presence and simply wouldn't have allowed this photograph to be taken. Or because this is an urban commercial neighborhood with street parking and traffic, he might have just not noticed Tim's presence or simply just wanted to hide in plain sight. At this point, we have Danny Gordon's encounter with men in black who may be responsible for allegedly shooting his son. And we have Tim Beckley, who actually took a photograph of a man in black. So far, the men in black have been threatening from a distance. What we need now is to dig deeper and find someone who's been threatened face to face by men in black. Two men approached, uh, dressed in black. They looked at me and says, we'll see you again soon. I'm Johnny Sands, and for 34 years, I've been intimidated by the men in black. We're meeting with Johnny Sands, a country singer who in 1976, while driving outside of Las Vegas, had one of the strangest men in black experiences we've uncovered thus far. I could see a light beam in the sky uh, directly to the right of me. It was a cigar-shaped looking object. Johnny Sands' car then shuts off. While he's working under his hood trying to get his car restarted, two of what he refers to as aliens walk up to him. And as they come closer to me, I started to run, but I realized I couldn't move. They had very, very glaring eyes. Their mouths were small and wrinkledy, looking like a man with no teeth, but they had a large, wide nose, and it looked like something protruding out on each side of their face. The one began to talk, but he wasn't talking through his mouth. So I asked him, where y'all from? And he said, up there. They asked me all these questions, and he says, we'll be going, but we'll see you again real soon. Uh, they turned and walked away, and a flash of light went, and they were gone. Johnny Sands' alien encounter grabbed a lot of headlines. He was a celebrity for it. A few days later, the Sahara Hotel invites Johnny to do a public demonstration of sorts in their lobby. They hire an artist to draw one of the aliens that Johnny saw. When he got to the gills and the nose, the artist says, why do, you, why do they have a nose and gills? And I said, I really can't answer that question. That's when the two men walked up and was standing there dressed in black. 
I did notice the one, he was a little clumsy in moving. He was kind of on the stiff side. Uh, he would lean in toward me, and then he said, let me answer that question for you if I can. There is an area in the sky that's eight and a half light years from here that's called Sirius. He said there is a planet that is known to be an aquarium type planet, half water, half land. And so this will explain the gills and the nose. He says, but we got to go now, but we'll see you again real soon. Well, that's the same thing that the aliens had just told me in the desert uh, uh, three or four days ago. As they went out the door of the hallway, the security guard was no farther away from behind them than you are from me. But when he got to the door, he turned around and he come walking back and he says, them guys just totally disappeared in thin air. Maybe in this case, the men in black were playing mind games with him. Not to dissuade him from talking, but to make his story seem so weird, so incredulous. But when he does talk, Nobody believes him. Johnny, this is Mike Brazel. Hey, Mike. Hi, how you Good doing? Good to meet you. We've drafted Mike Brazel, a forensic sketch artist, so we can wrap our minds around what these men in black might actually look like. He had a real squinty eyes, broad but stubby looking nose. His hair is going to go straight back. Now, what would you say his head shape was like? Kind of boxy looking with a heavy duty, broad chin. The mouth was not too big. What do you see there? Oh, put the black suit on him, that's it. 34 years, you hold this picture in your mind, this is it. The sketch of Johnny Sand's Man in Black is apparently spot on. I get a sense that Johnny's actually disturbed by looking at it. What do you think of Johnny Sand's story? He was very specific about what happened. It just seemed like, because of the detail, I think something real happened to Johnny Sands, and I don't think we can ignore that testimony. Johnny Sands not only passed a lie detector test, but he also passed a voice stress test. According to the authorities, he's apparently telling the truth, and as far-fetched as it sounds, I'm inclined to believe him. We're hearing a lot of different things. We're hearing that some of them are intimidating. Others are, are, are acting very weird, like possibly they're alien, as you might suggest. And so far, the only pattern that I have is that these people are seeing men dressed in black clothing. I mean, it's not just seeing men in black clothing. They're seeing men who surveil things like the photograph that Timothy Beckley showed us, or people who give warnings and then follow through on the warning. Whether these men in black are humans trying to protect the secrecy of the presence of UFOs, or whether they're actual aliens observing what we're doing, one thing is crystal clear. There is a direct connection between men in black and UFOs. We had pulled off to the side of the road next to the Grand Canyon Caverns. There were two men parked in a black car right where we were ready to pull off. My name is John Rhodes. I've been confronted by the men in black. We met John Rhodes in a previous investigation when we were looking for an underground alien base in Dulce, New Mexico. In 1996, when he went looking for an underground base near the Grand Canyon Caverns in Arizona, he must have gotten too close to something important because a couple of bizarre characters crossed his path. I was coming here from Las Vegas to investigate the Grand Canyon Caverns. Uh, we're pulling into this uh, pull-off outside a road. Here is a nice, shiny, new black car and two guys there in suits waiting for me. One was leaning against the car, the other one proceeded to walk up directly to me as I was parking. I got out of the car, the gentleman came over to my vehicle, and eye to eye, he t turned around and he said, Mr. Rhodes. And of course, I don't know him, but obviously he knew me. So these guys knew your name? Yes. Wow. They knew my name. More importantly, they knew I was going to be right there. 
I find it odd that in the middle of nowhere, two men suddenly appear and know John Rhodes' name. I don't think this was a random meeting. He turned to me and he said, well, you know, Mr. Rhodes, you can fall down out there and get hurt. You could fall down in some hole out there and nobody would ever find you again. And I knew this was a threat. And then what happened? They got back in their vehicle and I didn't even see them leave because I didn't want them to think that they had intimidated me. Did they have any kind of identification either on their jacket or in their wallet? Nothing. Or... As a matter of fact, when I looked at their vehicle, it just didn't have any dirt on it. It's not like somebody else drove by and some of the dirt kicked up from the road and covered their car. Their uh, shoes were absolutely shiny. You could see a reflection off them black. Uh, it didn't look like they had been there at all, as a matter of fact. It looked like they just stepped out of their car for the first time. A brand new car, brand new clothing, brand new shoes, everything, right down to the teeth. It strikes me as more than odd that in the middle of the desert, they had no dust on their car, no dust on their clothing. How do you explain that? You can't. Why would they warn you about this area? What were you looking for? What's here? You have to remember that only 3.3% of the entire Grand Canyon has ever been surveyed, which means that 96% of that, almost 1,900 square miles out there, have never had human feet set down in it. I think some of these ancient cavern systems that in this limestone for hundreds of square miles is perfect territory to build underground military installations. You don't have to take any dirt out. You just occupy an already hollowed out space. And if they're connected through cavern passages or natural tunnels, it would be perfect to be actually in this limestone area. So the geology of the Grand Canyon Caverns area is conducive to underground caverns, underground tunnels, and John Rhodes thinks a network of underground bases, perhaps connecting the Grand Canyon with Dulce and Area 51, all of which are reported hubs of reverse engineering and alien technology. This is incredible. If Rhodes' theory is correct, that there are tunnels connecting all these underground alien bases, could this be why men in black are showing themselves? Am I intimidated? I would say that I would be more intimidated for you. We're investigating one of the places where men in black might be coming from. We talked to someone who claims there's a network of tunnels connecting a vast array of secret underground alien bases. If this is true, the U.S. government has to know about it and most likely is very much a part of it. And if that's the case, there has to be a paper trail somewhere. We're meeting with Michael Schratt, a military aerospace historian who, in his research, has figured out how the U.S. government might be behind the men in black. So, Mike, let's get right down to it. Who are the men in black and who pays their paychecks? It's rumored, Bill, that the men in black are a covert government operation or organization funded perhaps by the black budget somewhat embedded within the Air Force budget. How exactly are they getting their funding? Is this money coming from taxpayers? They would probably get their funding just like many of these other programs get their funding from phony front organizations. The so-called black budget is an allocation of money towards the military and intelligence agencies. There is no accountability. How can we prove this? We have the actual Detroit Free Press article. This is dated February 8, 1987. And here it says, Secret Ledger hides military projects. Pentagon black budget has tripled under the Reagan administration. You know what's going on when it comes to the money in the black budgets today. Well, if we extrapolate the data, Kevin, it's clear that this black budget has ballooned to over perhaps $300 billion per year. What are they using this for and why? That's the real question. Here we have the actual security clearance organizational chart. And if you start here at the bottom, it starts at restricted, then we move to confidential, then we go to secret, top secret, SCI, USAP. Above that, there are 28 levels of top secret crypto. The president is at level 17. He's cleared for the GO codes or the nuclear launch codes. But then you'll see, in point of fact, there are at least 
20 levels of security clearances above the president, he has no need to know about these programs. This is all just a theory that there are 20 secret levels of black projects above the president of the United States. It's certainly plausible, though. And if men in black are really tied into the U.S. government, then it's quite possible that the president would have no idea. It's plausible deniability. Now, if these programs are that secret and they're so important to our national security, what kind of measures would be taken by some kind of agency if some of that information was to get out? If you can take a craft that can be to Mars and back by lunchtime, are you going to let that technology out to your competitors, your adversaries, or people within the government? No, they're going to comp keep it completely black, completely unacknowledged. They've got to control the high ground at any cost. Would they go as far as to use deadly force? Without a doubt. The investigators who've gotten the closest to the truth about the men in black died under mysterious circumstances. T. Allen Greenfield is a UFO researcher and author who's been investigating the men in black phenomenon for decades. And he knows just how far they'll go to silence people who know too much. There is a tendency to believe that the best cases about the men in black are old cases. A lot of the later cases don't get the same kind of publicity for one simple reason. Most of the people who specialized in investigating men in black died off mysteriously. And none of them were older than their 40s or 50s. The people who got the closest to the truth died. One famous ufologist is a legendary author, Morris K. Jessup, a pioneer. He wrote numerous books, and some researchers believe that when he got too close to the truth, the men in black silenced him once and for all. Jessup wrote a book called The Case for the UFOs. Supposedly, this perfectly well-balanced man who had no reason to commit suicide was suicided. He supposedly had asphyxiated himself in a car. Apparently, with such an elaborate way of doing it, it was obviously done by a third party or parties who had reason for Mr. Jessup to appear to have committed suicide. Police investigating on the scene said that it appeared to be a murder faked as a suicide. I believe that he was murdered because he had stumbled upon something in his book. He was a victim of what we can call the men in black. Another case of a UFO researcher dying an untimely death, allegedly at the hands of the men in black, is Frank Edwards. Edwards was at one time a very famous uh, mutual radio network broadcaster who was indeed talking a lot about UFOs. His life was threatened, he ignored it, he continued to broadcast and then he wrote Flying Saucers, Serious Business. Right. It's the only one that made the New York Times bestseller list, sold over a million copies. Not too long after that, he turned to his wife and said, Mary, I have the strangest feeling, and dropped cold dead. Was the cause of death ever determined? They said heart failure, but he didn't have any of the usual symptoms one would associate with a heart attack. I think it was some sort of poisoning of sorts, and it was a warning to all of us who were serious about ufology. Officials ruled the cause of Frank Edwards' death an apparent heart attack. However, medically, an apparent heart attack and an actual heart attack are two different things entirely. And shortly after that, strike three hit. Jim Keith wrote a book called Casebook of the Men in Black, and he died of a wrenched ankle. Nothing else wrong with it. Young man in great health strained his ankle and was dead. According to recent studies, simple injuries like ankle sprains can increase the risk of blood clots simply because blood tends to stagnate in the injured area. So dying from an ankle sprain, although rare, is possible. Maybe he had a blood clot, maybe he didn't. The probability is he died because he talked too much about the men in black. 
Always good to see you and just be Thanks. careful. Thanks, Alan. Thank you very much. Well, gentlemen, I think you've finally found the stories of people who were hurt by MIBs. What are your thoughts on what we've learned from Alan Greenfield? Some of these ufologists, if not all of them, could have died from the causes that were reported. Natural deaths, falling, liver disease, whatnot. People die at inopportune times, and when they die, there's always something they were working on, and if the work has something to do with UFOs, I think it's too easy to make the assumption that that had something to do with the death. There aren't that many ufologists in the world, right? Why is it that they didn't die natural, peaceful deaths? I mean, these were very strange, mysterious deaths. There's no doubt in my mind that there's a trend here. When all was said and done, Greenfield told us of seven ufologists who met untimely deaths at the heights of their careers. Seven ufologists who were also outspoken in the media, just like Danny Gordon. Now, this is not a coincidence. There is a connection here. One thing we should do, find some more witnesses who will take us to a place where they encountered a man in black. Find a place where there are men in black find a place where men in black are guarding something and see if we can bring men in black to us. We're here in Utah investigating the men in black. About 85 miles southwest of Salt Lake City is a military facility called the Dugway Proving Grounds. It was constructed in 1942 to test and develop chemical and biological weapons for World War II. It has been in continuous operation since then. What's actually going on there now is top secret and nobody knows for sure. A lot of UFOs have been seen in this area and some researchers are referring to Dugway as the new Area 51. Perhaps this is one of the places where the men in black are coming from. Hello. Kevin. Hi. Hi. Dave. Yeah, good Dave. to meet you. Dave Rosenfeld is a Utah UFO researcher who's been investigating the Dugway Proving Ground for a long time. He's taken some amazing pictures of UFOs and other things in the skies over Dugway, and he's uncovered some inside information. I got the information from a particular individual that works at Dugway. And this information was dates, times, locations of testing. Lasers, ring lasers, invisible camouflage, aerial vehicles testing. It was a big list. You know, when they do these kind of tests, it does attract UFOs. Dave posted this information on his public website, and then something happened. About 8 o'clock at night, I got a knock on the door. Two individuals, one's at the door, one's at the car, um, dressed in dark uniforms. Could you describe the car that they arrived in? It was a black car, four-door. Any insignia on the car, numbers? Government plates. The guy that came to the door, has got a crew cut, he's blonde, very intimidating, he's got the cop glasses on. He asked me first, are you Dave Rosenfeld? And I says, yes. He says, well, you've got some particular information on your website that we need to get off immediately. He more or less asked me if my computer was in the house. I said, yes. He said, well, can I come in and watch you take it off the website right now? And I said, yeah, it'll be off in 10 minutes. He came in, watched me do it. It ended with them, um, saying we, we don't want to see anything like this again on your website. If we see it again, we'll be back. And you don't want us to come back. There are a lot of holes in Rosenfeld's story. If the government wanted to shut down his website, they could have done it from anywhere. But I have to admit that paying him a visit is in keeping with the whole men in black intimidation factor. How long was this information on your website before these guys came to visit you? About four days. Do you feel that the information that you had on the internet was worthy of this type of treatment. Is it that important? It was. Forensic sketch artist Mike Brazel was able to draw composites of Johnny Sands Man in Black. Real squinty eyes, stubby looking nose. John Rhodes Man in Black. Uh, eyes that were rather almond shaped. The hair was almost like a military cut. And Dave Rosenfeld's Man in Black. He had a crew cut, kind of a flat top, narrow nose, more tall than muscular. 
three separate sketches, yet there's an eerie similarity about all of them. Perhaps they're the same man in black that was captured in Tim Beckley's photo. Clearly, there is a UFO man in black connection at Dugway. It really is starting to sound like the new Area 51. Perhaps there's a contingent of men in black originating out of Dugway. There's only one way to find out. We have to go there. We're meeting with Ken Storch and Bob X, who are instrumental in our investigation of underground bases both near here and in Dulce, New Mexico. Ken and Bob have been investigating Dugway for years, and they too had a run-in with Men in Black. We had intel that uh, this area was the new Area 51, and so we came out here to uh, gather intel and to verify if, if indeed that was the case. We had stopped in at uh, Willow Springs Lodge, and a gentleman up there uh, that owned it said, are you boys going out into the desert? And we said, yeah. He said, there's been some strange things happening out in the desert. He said, well, are you, are you guys carrying? Do you have guns? And we said, well, yeah. And he said, well, good. He said, just be alert. So we drove out to this location. It was about 9 o'clock in the morning, and as I pulled out of uh, the little turnout, I looked in the mirror and I could see a dust cloud coming real fast. This vehicle came right up on our and I kept slowing down, hoping that he'd go around and pass. Well, he did, and he kept slowing down. Finally, Bob said, hey, pull over. I've had enough of this. <laughs> we pulled over. Bob bailed out of the car. I stayed in the car and I adjusted the mirror. Now there were two individuals in the car. No insignia on the vehicle, no light bar, no nothing. The driver got out, Bob got out. I walk in between the vehicles. He had bloused pants on. Right. Had a vest. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see a badge, but I knew this guy was dressed in black. Mm -hmm. He says, what are you doing out here? I said, uh, I'm just taking some pictures. He says, I need to see some identification. I says, I need to see who you are. And this man goes, this is all you need to see. And he points to the G14 tag. A G14 tag or license plate is a government plate. The General Service Administration or GSA maintains vehicles in a motor pool across the country for official use by government agencies and departments. They're numbered G11 through G91. G14 is issued for an interagency motor pool system for large cars. As you can see, this place is very remote. There was the two of them and the two of us and nothing else around. And it could have gone south. So I, I had my weapon down between my legs. I had the driver's mirror focused on him and the rear view mirror focused on the passenger. And they were expecting to intimidate us into giving up what we were doing and, and you know, pretty much drop to our knees and, and you know, the holy grail type of thing. Well, it didn't happen that way. After that, got back in the vehicle, we took off. He followed us all the way to where the road turns, and we went to Vernon, and he went straight, but he was still on our butt. Maybe just like John Rhodes, Ken and Bob were getting too close to something the government didn't want them to see. I, I took the tag number down. And what'd you find out? Well, it was very interesting when I got back to my jurisdiction, because I was active law enforcement at that time, and I ran the tag, and it came back to a white Jeep for uh, Bureau of Land Management out of Park County, Colorado. And this wasn't a Jeep. And this wasn't a Jeep. So I called the uh, Park County B Bureau of Land Management supervisor, and I said, do you have a vehicle with this uh, tag number? And the supervisor goes, sure do. And I'm looking at it right out my office window. And Park County, Colorado is 450, 500 miles away. That tag number did not belong on that vehicle. That, I mean, that raised all kinds of red flags with me. It's all adding up. Men in Black have a long history of impersonating people. And now these two men in black are apparently caught in a lie. Perhaps those G14 plates were actually taken from another vehicle. Well, let me ask you a question. We're standing here right now. Yep. Do you think there's an eye on you? Absolutely. You better believe it. And they monitor the communicate. We've been told that a number of times. If you're on the radio or if you're on your cell phone, this whole area is being monitored. But we're on public land now. Why are we being monitored? Well, the base, base is right there. No sooner do we start talking about being monitored by Men in Black when two helicopters appear overhead. You see that, Kevin? Yep. There they come. They're going to come right over the top, boys.
You see that, Kevin? Yep. Here they come. They're gonna come right over the top, boys. We're near the Dugway Proving Ground in Utah. Some are calling this the new Area 51. Researchers believe there's evidence of reverse engineering going on here. And I don't think it's a coincidence that as soon as we start talking about men in black, dark helicopters show up. But how, how ironic that they picked this spot to fly over. Would you say they're black? You see any insignia on them? I don't see that. Well, that's no not insignia. all a draft. That's not all a draft. No, it's not. And there's no insignia. Do you see a tail number? No. I would say those were black. They, they were, were black. black helicopters. They were. I, yeah. That's really weird. I've worked with a lot of uh, Chinooks, man. They're, they're all of draft. What do you think is going on? Who are these guys and what, you know, what are they about? I, my take on it is that they are a private entity working in conjunction with someone that's involved in flying saucers or UFOs, whatever you want to call them. It gives government plausible deniability. In other words, here's a project and you, you farm, farm it off to a private company and they take care of the dirty work for you. But I believe ET's here and I believe our government knows about it. And therefore, what better way to have a certain entity that you can pawn off certain operations that you don't have to send your people on, you just make a phone call and say, hey, we got a witness out here that's got some evidence, why don't you go out there and intimidate them, either to keep their mouth shut, give up the evidence, or last but not least, adios, amigos. Guy on black right there, holy Guy on bus right there. Is he on black? He's getting in, uh, he's in that, he's walking in front of the white truck, parked next to the building. Okay. Backing up. Dude, they just hit that truck. The truck pulled behind the building. It's sitting right there behind the building. We're here at Dugway talking about the men in black. Is it a coincidence that a man in black has been apparently surveilling us for the whole time? Well, look, there's no denying. Men in black were surveilling us. Between the photo, all the eyewitnesses, uh, and the helicopters, and now this, it seems to me that there's a very strong military connection to the men in black. As investigators, we've gotten closer to the men in black than anyone. We've heard stories of threats and intimidation, and we've experienced some of that ourselves. They're real, and they know more about the UFO phenomenon than anyone. We did have credible witnesses, and it's hard to question first-hand accounts, but when you look at the sightings, the threats, the intimidations, and even our own encounter at Dugway, I think it's very likely that we're talking about coincidences here. Between the helicopters on a routine flight path and a maintenance man working the grounds, like many UFO sightings, these are just chance encounters. You guys are missing the big point, that the black projects that employ men in black has become so secret, so buried, so covered up by lies and distortion that even the men in black don't realize they're men in black. Men in Black have been around ever since the 1950s. And in the UFO community, there are all kinds of stories rife with threats, menace, and actual physical violence. When we got too close, Men in Black even approached us. We know how nefarious they are, and we know they're guarding a secret. And they will go to any lengths to keep that truth from being disclosed.